Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Claire, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be sober and a proud member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank the committee for this privilege because it's always a privilege to be asked to go anywhere to share my experience, strength, and hope. For me, it's a celebration of life because I'm one of the ones that should be dead from this disease. And I want to thank all of you for your hospitality and your as I look in this room and, 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 the, and the beautiful smiles, and I feel that high energy of love, but we, I have found in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's called unconditional love. And wherever I go today, I, I fit. That was not always the case for me. Uh, um, I don't know what happened uh, in Los Angeles uh, almost 16 years ago. When I had drank my way to the ghetto, when I lived in a little ghetto house with two children and sick of living and scared to die, uh, I believe that I was doomed to die of alcoholism as I understand it today, based on the opinions of Dr. Silkworth. But there I was, and, and that's where it had taken me. And alcohol had, by that time, stripped me of all human dignity. And it had stripped me of all moral ethics. And it left me to die, hey, and I couldn't even do that. I didn't even have a choice on how that was to be for me. And there I was in the ghetto, 65 pounds overweight, living off food stamps and welfare. And uh, my usual position by that time was a fetal position in front of the toilet, you know, in those rooms with the drapes drawn. And you see, I was, I came from a hip slick and cool road. And that was not exactly the position I wanted in my life. You see, but there I was, and I would always come to, at, at any given place, you know, sometimes spread eagle in the front yard. And wondering why the nosy neighbors were peeking out the window. <laughs> I pass out in the yard, you know, and I quick get up and brush myself off when I see the curtains moving back and forth. And I uh, give them a quick, quick, quick look, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I brush the dew off me and try and try to get up those stairs. Reminds me of a story I'm hearing around Los Angeles that I, that I just love. This minister said to the congregation, does anybody in here know where God is? And this little nine-year-old boy raised his hand and said, I know, preacher. He said, how do you know? He said, because every night my daddy comes home drunk. He comes up the steps and goes to the living room, goes down the hall, goes into the bathroom, gets on his knees in front of the toilet bowl. And I hear him in there saying, oh, God. <laughs> So that's where you could find me in front of the bowl in the morning saying, oh, God, that alcoholic prayer, if you just get me out of this one, I'm going to do better. And then I make a few deals, because when you come from the street in the fast lane, you learn how to survive by making deals. Now, I didn't believe in God, but it was always deal time. If you get me off before God this morning, um, I'm going I'm to do better. I, I got desperate once in a while, and I said, I'll even go to PTA meetings. <laughs> I'm almost 16 years old, but I haven't been to a PTA meeting yet. <laughs> because the moment I got off the floor and, 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 and the phenomenon of craving that Dr. Silkworth talks about would start. And I had to do something about the craving. The physical allergy coupled with the obsession of the mind. And see, I'd stand up and 
try to pull myself together and put on those tight jeans. And I lived three doors from the liquor store. And I put on those tight jeans and put on my bad leather jacket and my red wig <laughs> and my starfire earrings that hung to my shoulders. And I had long since stopped being cute. <laughs> I was smelling like a bear with the wind blowing south. I had become a full-blown wynette. And cute meant you had to wear heels, so I'd given those up. And I had a pair of gold fuzzy house slippers. <laughs> now, that'll get you there with the walk a little softer. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, I, I would uh, get that 59 cent because by that time when Chapter 3 talks about us switching to natural wines, I, I didn't switch to a natural wine. I switched to Ripple. <laughs> And that's not one of your natural ones. <laughs> I think they age it about three hours. <laughs> and I managed to be standing in front of some clerk at six o'clock in the morning, feeling that feeling of pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. And uh, playing those games of life. And I shuffle on down the street, you know, with that 59 cent. Now, every time I talk about that, there's a... There's a feeling inside of me of shame. Because when I read the chapter to uh, Bill W., when he talked about what he had to do, the thoughts of his disease and how he had to steal the money from his wife's purse and her meager earnings, and how many times that I'd take the money from my kids that my family and their grandparents would give them and and I'd always make the promise I couldn't keep that I was going to pay them back. And I feel that shame walking down there with that 59 cent. And not knowing how I ever got to that place in my life. But you see, I, I had to have that drink. So I had to go stand in front of that door and wait for the man to come. Because I'd so often beat them there. Because I couldn't stand pain of just breathing in and out. And I'd watch the Los Angeles Times truck drop off the papers. <clears throat> and the Wonder Bread man come and drop off the bread. And I'd be standing there cool. <laughs> in complete denial. And when, it, when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard new words that came down you know, in the vocabulary, in the English language that I hadn't heard words like denial and and uh, honesty and ego. I thought they talked about denial as denial was a river in Africa. I didn't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm standing there in complete denial in front of the liquor store waiting for the man to come. And this guy would come up there in this big black Lincoln, you know, car and and I'd look at him through my dark glasses and say to myself, boy, you know, don't they know who I am? And they really didn't care. I was just a woman standing in front of the liquor store at 6 o'clock in the morning, dying physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I'd wait for him to open the door, and, you know, and I'd feel that, that anxiety. You know, that he didn't hurry up and get his act together and get that change in the register. And in Los Angeles, in, in the liquor stores, they have a grocery department. And I don't want this guy to know I'm in there for me. I'm the only one in there, but I don't want him to think I'm in there for me. So I go over in the grocery department and browse. Now, normal people don't get out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning <laughs> to go to the local liquor store to browse. I mean, so, you know, and when he get his chin out of, the, out of the corner of my eye, I was having that feeling, you know, like I'm going to self-destruct if I don't hurry up and get that drink. So I go up there and play those games. I don't know if any of you play games with games with the uh, liquor clerks at 6 o'clock in the morning. They give you that side look, you know, like, what do you what do you want? And I, you know, I get cute and get back into my old, good old days, and I'd say, well, now, darling, <clears throat> Uh, I'll have a little ripple this morning, but it's not for me. 
I have house guests. <laughs> Honey, I hadn't had a guest in my house <laughs> for a couple of years. I had been 86 out of the streets, you know? And he'd say, yeah, yeah, and shove it in that paper bag and wrap top of the bag around the ball, and he'd hand it to me, and I could feel that rush. I just need to get out of his sight, get past that plate glass window, and lean on that building at that hour of the morning in the darkness, you know, and unscrew the top and take a hit off that wine and say to myself, and I'm not going to drink anymore today. And I'd make that promise, and I could never keep that promise. Because I'd shuffle on back to that little house and sit in that overstuffed chair and I'd drink and think, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing more pitiful in the world than an alcoholic sitting in the overstuffed chair drinking and thinking. <laughs> and stare out the window and, um, listening, and listen to my, my two children who were about eight and ten at the time. Getting up and, and, and trying to get themselves ready for school. And I sit there and feel that failure, you know, in every area of my life that I couldn't get out of that chair and go participate in their lives. And I'd make some more promises. You know, it's going to get better tomorrow. And I'd sit there and in the, in, and, um, and I, and I would stare out that window and I guess I felt like the man who said, I had a dream last night. That life was passing me by and I wasn't in it. And I look out that window and reminisce about the good old days and, and being in the fast lane and all the opportunities I had had and how I took a drink one night and the drink took me and then I gave it the power for the next 27 years to bring me to that place. And in the summertime in Los Angeles, you know, it, it's really hot. And, and I used to try to doctor up that ripple. And I'd take a slice of lemon and a slice of orange and put it in a glass and, and, and a little cherry and make a cocktail out of that stuff. And after two hits off of that, then i pass out. And when i come to, you know, fruit flies would be flying over my drink. <laughs> And some of those little buggers always managed to fall in. <laughs> and I would reach in and pluck them out and flip them away and say to myself verbally, loud and clear, and alcohol kills all germs. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd drink it. And as I'd look out that window, you know, I, I would think about how did I ever in my whole life get from that place to this place and sitting in the ghetto you know, what happened? Somehow I'd always had that feeling that, that the message about life had been passed out in the world and, and somehow I had missed the message of how you live and how you, be com how you can be comfortable and how you can have, you know, that family unity and how you can fit and be somebody. I um, sit and look out that window and remember, you know, I, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, my parents were not alcoholic. My father was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian who was born on a reservation in North Carolina and who migrated to Atlanta at about the age 21 years old, who couldn't read or write, who taught himself with, uh, to read and write by reading the Bible, my family were very strong, tight-lipped, hard-nosed, no-nonsense Baptists. And uh, I'm the youngest of the seven children, and I'm the alcoholic. And I believe I was born feeling restless, irritable, and discontented with life. And uh, my father was uh, very talented. He was a creative artist who was very successful who made a wonderful living for us, and we had all of the outside pleasures of life. 
and we were taught the rules on how to live. And I missed the message, and I'm learning in Alcoholics Anonymous what they tried to tell me then, but I didn't want to listen. Um, I um, would sit there at that, at that big table in that house and listen to him talk about being self-sufficient, and hear him talk about being counted in the community, and how you how you could be successful. And they, even at, at the early age of five, when they pushed me out of that house and in that, out of that environment into the real world, you know, into the first grade, I'm one of the ones that could have used a drink in the first grade. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my drink became 101 proof bourbon on the rocks when I started out there on that path. And a little bourbon on the rocks in the first grade would have been wonderful just to get me to the second grade. <laughs> and I can remember, you know, that, that fear. My life was always motivated by fear, self-centered fear. And I can remember being in the first grade and, 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 and just terrified of, of those other kids. And I didn't know how to interact with people. And we, I can, my family was wonderful, and they gave me all those other things. But there was something about our communication at a level of not knowing how to touch each other or embrace me. And, and it was just very cold, shut down. And just do as I say, do it. Children will be seen and not heard. And um, in that first grade, I remember that I also was born with a bad attitude. And, um, and I remember being in the first grade and, and the teacher saying things to the to the children, like teachers would say to children, you know, as they try to teach us. And I can remember the teacher was always picking on me. I was always a victim. <laughs> and uh, and the teacher would say those simple things that they say, like, Clara spelled cat. And we had those little chairs where the arm was attached to the back. And I can remember standing next to the chair and just trembling out of fear of that authority. And my attitude was, uh, why should I spell cat? Why don't you get somebody else to spell cat? And uh, <laughs> and I would stand there, and then I would wet myself. Now, that'll fix her, and she won't call on me anymore. <laughs> uh, I'd have to go out on the playground, and children can be cruel, and uh, they would call me piss tail. That is not exactly... Uh, <laughs> that's not exactly how you impress friends, you know? But a little bourbon on the rocks, but not only I would have been able to spell cat for her, I could have told her what to do with the cat. <laughs> and it got worse. From that, from the first grade on, I, my first addiction was loneliness and isolation in school. I was not a good student. Uh, I didn't know how, I didn't know how, how to interact with people. Um, my feelings about myself were always the same as, long, as far back as I could remember. Lack of self-worth, low self-esteem, and I always felt inadequate. It didn't matter how good I looked on the inside, you know, on the outside. You know, the inside always felt that way. Uh, I remember that in high school, uh, you know, I, I just isolated and stayed alone, but I, I had some talent as, it, that made up for my, my inability be a good student, and um, and it was art. So I drew and I painted and I was alone a lot, a loner. And then my art teacher suggested that I apply for a scholarship to one of the finest art schools in the country in Boston, Massachusetts, and I got that scholarship. And I can remember the anger as I sat on that train because, you see, I'd had a lot of trouble in Atlanta because I, I never could adjust to the system. And I never could adjust to any authority. And I didn't want people telling me what I could do and where I could go and where I could sit. So I was always in trouble and I was always getting thrown out, you know, of, of, of those places. And I was get, I was in, had a lot of trouble in school for the same reasons. And so when I sat on that train and I had no friends who came to see me off, I can remember my attitude 
as I sat on the train when my family came and, and, and gave me all that outside stuff that made me look good. To go away on this new adventure in life. And when the train pulled out, I felt, you know, I felt abandoned by the people I thought that should have come. And, and I gave them the finger as the train rolled off. And, and I said to myself, and I'm never coming back to Atlanta as long as I live. And I was glad because I wasn't going to have to go to that Baptist church anymore. And when they used to have those big tents with the revivals, you know, and, and they dragged me off there, and I fought it every way, every step I could go, and, you know, and I got tired of them praying over me, you know, that sinner on the first row. And uh, I got tired of those deacons spitting over my head, you know, you know, trying to save me. <laughs> I didn't know what I'd done, but they were going to say, they were determined to save me. And uh, when I get bored with all that, I just go to sleep on the front row, and um, and I was afraid to be baptized too because I was afraid of water because uh, I couldn't swim and when I'd asked my parents to let me go swimming they said well you can't go swimming till you learn how to swim now how the hell are you going to learn how to swim <laughs> if you don't go swimming you know I mean I had a lot of confusion in my life <laughs> so when I arrived in Boston I knew it was going to be different and it never occurred to me I took me with me same fear, same M.O. of looking good. Don't get too close, because if you get too fo- close, you're going to know the secret. That I know about me, that I was determined nobody else would ever know about those secrets. When I got the Alcoholics Anonymous, I heard a man at the podium say one night, you're sick as your secrets. When you do that fourth and fifth step, you better get rid of those secrets. So it can open the door so you can start to walk tall. In sobriety. Um, so I isolated there. You know, I never knew that, that there was a purpose for me in life. And I guess what I've come to believe in the power greater than myself had already set the road for me to walk. And today I look around in the art world and I read um, uh, the art sections and I see on television some of the students I went to school with who are famous in that world today and you know for a long time it was that feeling of jealousy and how come God didn't let me but God's got me exactly where God wanted me to be standing in a meeting on a beautiful Sunday morning in Little Rock, Arkansas doing his work and not his job And being willing to do it. With a feeling of love. I um, isolated a lot in movies. That became my second addiction. See, because I could hide out in the movies in Boston and I wouldn't have to put, you know, be involved, you know, with those people that I felt less than. And I felt inferior. You know, I'm one of those alcoholics that felt less inferior with a superior attitude. <laughs> and you rattled me and nothing came out, <laughs> you know. And I'd sit in there and look at the movies and, and just daydream and, and how people lived. And I'd watch those families. And, and God, I thought, how wonderful that must be. And I wonder if that'll ever happen to me. And I'd never seen alcohol to my knowledge. My family didn't drink. My peers, my my brothers and sisters who had, who had, had been the high achievers and, and, and had reached those goals that my father set those expectations for us to, somehow I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. And, uh, one night, and I didn't know how to date. I was about 21 years old. Had never had a date. Terrified of boys. And, uh, I had a date and it was a young man who was just like me, who was, who was a loner. He was going into one of the universities in Boston and, uh, we were walking down the street. And I heard this music, and I was a lover of jazz music, and I would sit in those movies and wish that I could be an entertainer, you know, and I don't know where I ever got that one from. I my, I always lived in a fantasy world, and if I could just be somebody else, not me, but somebody else, you know, I could be, you know, I could just, if I wanted to be counted, you know, I didn't have what it took. And this young guy and I were walking down the street, and I heard this jazz music coming out of him. Of a, of a, of a, of a, of a club. 
you know, it was one of those jazz clubs. And I started to drink at the height of the jazz era where it was just wonderful. And um, I'm a real alcoholic on page 21. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because it, exp- it describes on that page what a real alcoholic is. And I was one of those when I walked into that club and walked up to that bar. And I remember sitting on the bar stool and the bartender, that, you know, somehow bartender seemed to have that Pepsi didn't smile. And this guy leaned on the bar, and he said to us, what are you going to have to drink? And I didn't know, and this this guy didn't know. But I remember in the movies, um, they always talked about martinis. And I was about to uh, commit my first hip-slick cool act. (laughs) And I leaned back on that bar, and I said to the bartender, we'll have a martini, honey, and make it dry. I had no idea what I was ordering. (laughs) And he whipped around, and he had these stem glasses, and he added a little to each glass. And I looked at mine, and it was about the color of that paper there. It looked like lemonade. And in Georgia, we drank a lot of lemonade in the summertime. And, and I looked up and down the bar to see what what uh, people did with that. And uh, so I just didn't know you sip drinks. So I opened my mouth, drank the whole thing at one time. I was a pig from the gate. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you know that feeling that that, that Dr. Silkworth talks about, that feeling, that that drink took me. And I looked around that room, that club, and I want to tell you a whole new life again. You know, my whole world opened up, and I remembered feeling good for the first time in my life. I didn't feel afraid. And I'd always, you know, had some fantasy about men. And and there were a couple of guys sitting on the bar, you know, they weren't even sitting together. And I had always wanted to know what it would be like if I went down there and kissed one of them. So I uh, got off the stool and strolled down there. <laughs> I mean, you know, after that first drink, you know, gave me that courage I always needed. <laughs> And I started to walk the walk and talk the talk. (laughs) And I strolled down there and I kissed both of them. (laughs) And I was to do a lot of strolling from that point on. (laughs) Because, you see, that first ring started me uh, to make some decisions about my life. I like to think of it as I came to a crossroads. And it seemed to me that every crossroad I came to from that point on was I chose the road that was self-destructive. And you see, because I liked that feeling of living on the edge. And I walked out there and I made my decisions right away that I didn't want that art career. You see, I wanted to get out there and I would show them. I would show that family I didn't have to do it that way. That all I needed was money, property, and prestige, and power. And I would get it an easier, softer way. So um, I stepped out into the streets of Boston, and I hooked up with the pimps. 180 degrees from that Baptist upbringing. Uh, The pimps and the hookers and the madams. I used to call my new friends colorful. But the big book calls them loyal companions. (laughs) And I was out there so long, you know, I became one of them. I became one of those loyal companions because I got trapped in the mire of alcoholism and I couldn't get out. Um, I got married, had a little, a little son, and I didn't know what to do about that. I didn't know the role to play there. See, because my love, what love did I, you know, was just a word. You see, and I thought love was something you bought. And I bought a lot of it. You know, I uh, bought all the love that I could afford with the fair weather friends that Bill W. talked about in his story. And he, too, loved those, those jazz clubs in New York City. And so I started playing those games of life. And, 
and running those streets in Boston and and New York and Harlem. You see, you know, by the you know, and not not only learning to walk the walk and talk to talk, you know, that that walk for me near the end became a dance of death. And I did the dance with a glass in my hand, trying to find some balance on how to straighten up, you know, and uh, and it got worse. And I, I had that little son, and I pushed him off on his grandparents to raise him because I didn't know how. He chronologically in the bottom of, body of a woman, you know, with the emotions of a five-year-old who was always looking for some human power to take care of me. And to save me and make it all right. To make the journey of living all right, you see, because I didn't know how to do it. Because for me, life was just a bowl of cherries while I did the dance. I um, felt guilty about that. And I'd take another drink. Whenever I had to deal with my, my feelings, I'd just take another drink and think about it. I say, well, you know, who's going to know a hundred years from today? You know, I could always justify my behavior, but the pain of guilt was always there, and I could never drink it away. Thank God for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 Steps of Recovery, and honoring the traditions and its spiritual principles. You see, I, in the eighth and ninth step, I was able to make amends to that son and the other two that we had after we moved to California. I um, kept hanging out in the streets. And I didn't know, except to a lot of inventories, when the book says, selfishness and self-centeredness, we think, is the root of our troubles. We alcoholics are driven by a hundred forms of fear. Self-delusion, self, self-seeking, and self-pity. And I was one of those that sat on those bars walking that walk and talking that talk with the best that money could buy. And I was a poor me. Poor me, poor me, poor me a drink. <laughs> and I'll think about it. And uh, I got out there and uh, I kept looking. And my ex-husband tra- traveled a, a lot in the, in the family business. And and I had free run of the streets. And I was always looking for Mr. Wonderful. Now, if you were hanging jazz bars all around the East Coast where that I was doing at the time. Sooner or later, Mr. Wonderful shows up. And uh, I'm, I'm not name dropping, but this is part of my story. And I was sitting on a, on a, on a bar one night uh, and um, drinking with the late, great legend, Billy Holiday. And I was, uh, we were drinking and, and this man walked in there with a black hat turned down all the way around and had a blue top coat over his shoulders, and this dude was so cool he couldn't get his arms through the sleeves. <laughs> he had two guys behind him that looked like clones, <laughs> and they were just just like him. And um, he re- he looked at me and he winked, you know, and he reached in his pocket and he pulled out ten one hundred dollar bills and. He- he spread it on the bar like a deck of cards, and he said to me, spend it. Then I knew that God had answered my prayer. <laughs> and I was going right off in the sunset, and it turned out that he was the head of the Boston Mafia family. And when the second step says that we would be restored to sanity, you see, I didn't know that I was about to step off on a, an incredible ride. And now I had a limousine to ride in with bodyguards. And that they'd drive up at the front of my apartment and ring that bell, and I'd stroll out of there, you know, and, and I was already insane. Because I was drifting further and further away from reality. And I was, you know, I was looking for the impossible. You know, I was always looking for happiness, but I never knew the difference between happiness and a good time. And that's what I was looking for. And I'd step into the back of that limousine and we'd go downtown Boston and pick up the entourage. And we'd play the games of life. 
from one jazz club to another one and watch the great stars of the time. And I'd become totally involved in one that it would rub off on me by osmosis. Nothing rubs off of you by osmosis, not even the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> You got to work for it. <clears throat> and it tells me in the promises as I work for it, <clears throat> the promises will come true because God is doing for me what I can never do for myself. And um, it seems to me in my moments of madness sometimes, and we'd get in that, that limousine and, and drive to New York just to have a drink. And in my moment of madness, it seems that the God I've come to believe in would try to get my attention. And I was so involved in my alcoholism, you see, I couldn't see for looking. And one morning I was being driven home in that limousine, and I looked out the back window, and it was on a Sunday morning. And my life was totally unmanageable. And as I looked out that window, it seemed to me that a voice must have said to me, something's wrong with your life. Because as I looked out that window and saw young families with their children going somewhere, apparently to church, and I had made a commitment when I sat on that train going east that I would never put my foot in the church again, because that certainly hadn't been the answer. And I looked out that window and, and, and I saw these little, little kids all dressed up and I thought about my little son who was about 10 years old and, and I had never had that experience with him. And I'm sure people were going to, to, to church or synagogues or some place to enhance their spiritual growth. And what I was feeling at that time was like a lost child in the world of the, the wilderness of the world. Just out there lost. And um, I said, I got to get out of Boston. Boston's the problem. We left Boston, went to California, moved into the Santa Monica area, and um, and we had two more children, got into a small business that became successful. You see, I had never had enough self-worth to deal with success. That always belonged to somebody else, God's chosen kids. You see, I was just a rebel on the planet, you know. I believed in reincarnation, and I always told myself I was going to do it in the next life. <laughs> And um, and I went on out there, and I continued to do the dance. Now, you know, when it, it talks about in the big book, and you see, I really had long since crossed over that invisible line. And in the morning, drinking started, and and uh, then I drank away that marriage, which was, to, as I know it, to understand it today, was a very sick relationship. It was two adults in the bodies of adults with the emotions of two five-year-olds in a playpen. Neither one willing to grow up and take any responsibility for our lives or the lives of our children. Because neither one of us knew how. We didn't know anything about unconditional love and nurturing. So we went on playing the games of life. Until finally, you know, I started those horrendous blackouts that he talks about in The Real Alcoholic. And I started losing it. And I watched it all go as I screamed and yelled and tried to hold on, not realizing that I am absolutely powerless over all of it. And I had to lose it, and, I, and thank you, God, for what you gave me. And thank you for what you took away, and thank you for what you look, left me with. Because you left me with life and a second chance at it. When I sat in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, it was a new beginning. And when I sat in that chair that night, almost 16 years ago, I had no idea that my life was going to be rocketed to a fourth dimension of living. And that I had found a way. And that it was possible. I spent my whole life 27 years of drinking, you know, looking for the impossible. And it was so simple. 
I have learned that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is a simple program for complicated people. And so um, it all started to go. I watched Marsha put a lock on my house. I watched my brothers and sisters who love me the most. And I, I shall always remember the pain in their eyes. When they look at me and say those things that people who love you say, why are you killing yourself? What is it? What is it? What can we do? And I would look at them just full of fear and have a drink and say, but you don't understand. I'm having a good time. And then they had to walk away and they didn't know anything about Alan and they didn't know, but they released me with love without knowing that that's what they were doing. See, as God participated in their lives and they let me go. And by that time, that older son was about 18 years old and I can remember that pain <clears throat> in his life when he looked at me with that look of combination of love and hate. And where his eyes would tear up, but the tears wouldn't run. And he'd say, but we don't know who you are. God, you've just never been there for us. I don't know what to do. And I'd make myself a drink. And I'd think about that. And I'd feel the pain and the words wouldn't come, but what I wanted to say to him, but you don't understand. If I knew better, I'd do better. But I'm doing the best I can. And, um, and he didn't run away. He just walked just walked away. And uh, I watched them put the uh, <clears throat> I watched them put the lock on the door and I watched the banks uh, repossess the cars and the trucks and the employees and the internal revenue sell it off and, and they put me on the street with a bag and two young kids. I heard that uh, that the rent was cheap in Watts. And I started down the road, and I ended up in that ghetto, living off food stamps and welfare, and no more limousines. And I didn't have the price to buy the love anymore, and none of the, not one of those fair weather friends showed up and stood next to me in front of the liquor store at 6 o'clock in the morning and said, how are you today? What are you going to do about your life today? What can I do to help you? Because they were all gone. And one, and now I was, got into the hospitals and, uh, not for the treatment of alcoholism. See, I detox sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. With the loving arms of the fellowship and especially the women. And I started to get the shapes and the throwaways in the meetings, you know. And they put their arms around me and say, honey, you're gonna be alright. Just don't drink today. And I had to believe them as I stand here almost 16 years sober. You know what? They never lied to me. See, they told me the truth and they told me what would work. And uh, I started ending up in those hospitals like County, Los Angeles County General and getting stitched up for behavior under the influence and blackouts and nervous interns doing a little needlework. <laughs> and then I ended up in Daniel Freeman Hospital in Inglewood one Sunday morning. It seems to me that Sunday mornings were always the morning that I would be in those places. And I remember coming to in, in this, it's, it's a Catholic hospital. And when I came, you know, I'd been beaten unconscious. And when I opened my eyes, you know, you hear all that noise in those places where people who are dedicated to saving your life, man, when you don't want your life saved. And, you know, I had wanted to commit suicide, and I'm glad I couldn't do that. Because I have learned that committing suicide is a final solution to temporary problems. And um, I stood up, you know, in front of those places, you know, and all those problems of the world were on my shoulders, and I couldn't do anything about it. But I lay there in that hospital with the police at the foot of the bed, 
and uh, and these two nuns. It was an older nun and a young nun, and <clears throat> and I wouldn't cooperate. I'd learned from an Indian father, you don't tell the secret. They'll use it against you. Don't don't you ever tell them. And I hung out with the mafia for no, a number of years, and they said you better not tell the secret. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I told I told the police to buzz off and. That older nun who was a lady about 60-some years old, and I remember she turned on her heels and she stormed out of that room because I wouldn't cooperate. But that young nun, and I didn't want anything to do with God's kids, you know. I mean, she was about 23 years old, and she leaned over me, and she looked down at my face, and I can remember her eyes were so blue, and her gray habit on, and the, that white part of her face, the habit around her head, and she looked at me and she said, how did you ever let your life get into such a state? And my attitude was, what does she know? Young nun, what, do, what does she know about what goes on out there in that world? What does she know about the battles you have to, just to stay alive? And um, I looked up at her, but the question stood in my mind, and I guess it was one more time God trying to get my attention. Because she was right. What had happened to my life? <clears throat> Three days later, they gave me back my, I had a brain concussion. I was bleeding out of both my eyes. All my ribs had been kicked in. They put that two-inch wide white adhesive tape around my body, right on my ribs to hold them in place. And they, um, three days later, gave me back my wig. And, uh... <laughs> My red wig and my jacket and my jeans and my, and my and my bad boots, and they they put me out in front of Daniel Freeman Hospital and and you see I'm an alcoholic, and you see the you know the insanity of the disease you know Dr. Silkworth didn't exactly explain that but you know the insanity the obsession started, and I look up and down the street and I do what an alcoholic like me will do, I saw a sign down the road that said liquor. And I just hunched over, went down there, bought myself some Ripple to get out of my pain. And one morning in that ghetto, a few weeks later, I just uh, came to on that floor one morning. And I couldn't make the run. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we talk about uh, a moment of clarity. But I want to believe that mine was a divine intervention of a power greater than myself that must have kissed me gently on my cheeks and said, get off the floor, child, because you don't have to live like this anymore. And it was my moment of truth. And I stood up, and I didn't make the run, and, it, and I have not made the run. Because I called a friend since that day, and so I called a friend who, who told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I surrendered, and I heard myself saying on that floor that morning, Oh, God, please, there are no more deals. I'm going to die. Help me. And that's been the answer for me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I ask God for help, and I get it. Please come to the front desk. Please come to the front desk. And as I... um. Lay there on that floor. I called this friend who told him about Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, she's not an alcoholic. We've been friends for over 30 years. It seems that God leaves a guardian angel for us. To stay close. And we all have our angels. Who help us stay on the right track. And this lady told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. I called that morning. A man said, good morning. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. May I help you? And I said, man, my name is Clara, and I can't stop drinking, and the secret was finally out. What a relief, you know, just admitting that I couldn't do it anymore. And he said, welcome now, Alcoholics Anonymous, and we don't drink here one day at a time and don't drink today. And what I heard was from him, a stranger on the phone early in the morning, uh, when my usual business, I was going about my business, was getting dressed. And he said, don't drink. 
And so I um, didn't drink that morning. I called my brother, and I said he was the last one who would come and, and help me with those kids and give me a little side money, you know, to, to help feed them. And and I said I said to him, I said, you know, I, I think I found some hope. There hadn't been any hope in my life. I guess it was the kind of hope that Bill W. has in his story. And when I read his story, it's, it's just it's for identification, you know. I, listen to, I, I read it for similarities and not the differences. And I also find in his chapter that he'd gone as far, you know, as we go, and, and there was hope in recovery. And, and so I, um, so that I, I, uh, I, I, that morning I, I didn't drink. And I didn't know about detox, and I remember trying to get myself together, and, and I, went, I opened the closet door and what to wear. See, looking good almost killed me out there. And I had, you know, here I was, 65 pounds overweight, and I had one dress, and I'm standing in the door trying to figure what to wear. <laughs> a red velvet dress with wine stains on it. <laughs> and so I get that, that wig, I got that girl out, and um, I raked her up. You know, I clipped some bangs, sprayed it, put it on the head, you know, getting ready for my first meeting of alcohol. Some moms hope I never in my life have to go through that again, <laughs> getting ready, and then I started to shake and vibrate, and I didn't know what was happening to me, because you see, I'm one of the ones that all my family, other friends are dead from the disease, seeing God made me a servant, that I didn't have to die, with that glass in my hand, so around two o'clock, you know, I went over to Woolworths, and I stole some eyelashes. <laughs> For my first meeting. <laughs> they come quite long, and I didn't know you're supposed to trim them. <laughs> so, you know, I'd learned to be a thief out there in those streets. If it wasn't nailed down, honey, it was mine. <laughs> and so I took those eyelashes, put them under that jacket, and I beat it back to that house. And around, you know, my brother had come. He'd left the car. I remember he, he had tears in his eyes, and he hugged me. And I, he said, I hope this is going to work for you. And um, so around 7 o'clock, I was all dressed, and I had the wig on, and and uh, the eyelashes was the last attraction. It was about 7 o'clock. It was an 8 o'clock meeting, and I remember trying to get the glue along the edge of the lash. And I was bouncing off the walls, you know. <laughs> I remember holding my elbow and waiting for an opportune moment. <laughs> I slammed the lash in, <laughs> and one end struck up here, and one was down here. And with my ego, I leaned in the mirror, and I said, you're looking good. <laughs> and I got in that car, and I went off to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I walked up that walk, and they, the man didn't tell me that I can remember. I have not, it has not been revealed to me that I heard in my conversation in the central office that morning that he said it was in the church. It was all part of the master plan, because I'm sure if I'd heard it was in the church, I might not have gone. And I walked up to that church, and big, tall Scotty uh, put his hand out, and he said, Welcome. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, and keep coming back. And I strolled in there, still trying to be cool. And I watched those smiling faces. And when I got sober, they had real coffee cups. <laughs> and Scott had said to me, get yourself a cup of coffee and sit down. And uh, I was just so nervous and shaking so bad, the coffee was uh, slopping over the sides, and I didn't want you people to see me nervous. So I put it down on the table, and I put my hands in my pockets, and I strolled around the meeting, and and I waited for the meeting to decide. But when I sat in that chair, I'm, I'm sure my name was etched on it. And it was waiting for me. I had paid the price to sit there. And as I, I they started the meeting, I, I was sitting there thinking about uh, growing up in Atlanta. 
and how I tuned out all that religious training and thinking and school of thought. And I sat there, but I remembered, you know, singing in the junior choir in Union Baptist Church. And we used to sing a song that the slaves used to sing. And the words went like, sit down, child, you must be tired. And rest a while. And if you knew on this journey of sobriety this morning, I hope you'll just sit down and rest a while. You don't have to do the dance. The moment of truth has come. And you're in the loving arms of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, where we pass on the message of love. And we tell each other it works. And we are examples that the program works. And so I uh, thought about, you know, sitting there and, where, you know, like feeling like the drowning person. You know, they say when you drown, as you go down the last time, your whole life flashed before you. And I took a quick look at my life, and I had drank away the best years of my life. And I had nothing to show for it. But that I was dying physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I knew I was in the right place because for the first time in my whole life, I felt safe. I am always safe in a meeting of alcoholics and others because I can feel the energy of love. And we reach out because alcohol doesn't care who you are. You see, you know, it will continue to strip you of everything that life means. And uh, the lady behind me, they started the meeting, they asked for the hands of the newcomers, and I didn't know I was a newcomer. See, I didn't know the language in Alcoholics Anonymous, but what I have learned that the language is the language of the heart. And um, they asked for the hands of the newcomer. I didn't raise my hand. I didn't know I was a newcomer. The lady behind me touched me on my shoulder said, raise your hands, honey, you're a newcomer. <laughs> And that lady became my, she appointed herself my sponsor. <laughs> and she's still my sponsor today. And, um, and she said, now here's my number. Now you go home and you call me. And I'll tell you what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. And I got in my brother's car and I went back to the ghetto. And I called this lady and she started to tell me about Alcoholics Anonymous. That it's a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other. And she said, don't you drink today, honey. And I was not employable when I got sober. I had no real skills. Because the lifestyle I had led, you don't have to have many skills for that, you know. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't know how to get a job, and I didn't know about job ethics, and I didn't know anything. I had an art background. And... Uh, and a street back guy, and uh, I didn't know anything about that, so uh, I, I didn't work my first six months, and my sponsor finally said to me, you get a job, and I don't care how you get it as long as it's honest, and stop whining. <laughs> I whined my first two years. I remember once I was, you know, I just wasn't aware that I was doing that, you know, it was poor me, you know, poor me sober, but. I was in a meeting, and I was whining, and I remember this guy came up to me after the meeting after I'd taken up my three minutes and everybody else's, and, <laughs> and he said to me, Clara, come down off the cross. <laughs> he said, we need the wood. <laughs> and, you know, I stopped whining. I got, kind of got the message there, you know. <laughs> And they told me to get into service, and when I got my first job was a waitress, and, uh, you know, you can't believe, you know, when, 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 about the ego, that I had to be stripped, that ego. You know, I had to, it had, it had to bring me to my knees, so. And I, um, got a job as a waitress, and I hated that job. I was a terrible waitress. 
you know, I just bitched and whined and carried on. And I'd go home every night and call my sponsor. I went to 12 meetings or 14 meetings a week, and, and I put the food out for those kids because I had become active in their lives, in their lives. And I was out of the bed in the morning, and I fixed breakfast for them, and I didn't have to sit in that chair and listen to them do it. I was participating. And um, so I uh, I got this job, and, and I'd take three buses when I was used to riding in limousines. You know, I'd get to the second bus stop, and there was a pay station. I'd call my sponsor, and I'd say, I can't make it today. She said, yes, you can, honey. Just don't drink and hang up. <laughs> <laughs> I get back on the bus, and I get there. And by the time, you know, I began to feel some feelings of self-worth because I began to show up and be counted. And that's how I did it. And uh, finally, um, at the end of my second year working as a waitress, my sponsor made me keep that job for two years. She said, honey, you're very sick. And uh, you need you need to learn how to interact with people, and get that rage out of the way, and and deal with your anger. And uh, and I did. And by the end of the second year, I I went back into that business. I drank away. What I am in is property management and uh, commercial maintenance. And what I do in Los Angeles today, I'm not only employable. I employ 12 people today. I don't stand in front of liquor stores at 6 o'clock in the morning waiting, wetting myself. And I show up and I participate in life. And, and what I do is I have contracts to the rich and the famous in Beverly Hills and movie stars. And that's what I do. And I don't lie and I don't cheat. And I try to practice the spiritual principles of the program of alcoholics in my life every day. In the third and eleventh step. I turn my will and my life over to care of God, and I suit up and I show up. And I do what I've been taught to do here. And I, they told me to get in the steps. I made those amends to those kids, and I pulled them together when I was two years sober. I stayed sober my first year, not because of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, where, which is the basic text of this program, where all the answers are, where the message is. I'm just the messenger to tell you this works from my experience through you. And I, um, you know, but after about, in the, in between the second and the third year, you see, I got started to get well. And, you know, I started to hear the music. And I started to look at the outside again, and I bought this house, and now I got this big car. And, you know, I forgot about the pain. I was standing in front of the liquor stores and waking up with strangers. The one thing I've learned, Sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, is that pain has no memory. It has no memory. It forgets. And the insanity of my disease and, and the committee would tell me, you can do it this time. You're different. I'm in service and told service the program of Alcoholics Anonymous through God's grace, and I go to the institutions, prisons, and hospitals up and down California and outside of that straight state, you know, and I, I hear them, I hear the yets talking about the yets. And how the book tells me, you know, you know, that the insanity will return. And when it returns, you see, I have no mental defense against that first drink. And I have to be on guard by staying close to the power greater than myself that I love to call God today. And so, um, I started getting well, and and uh, and I started ducking meetings and lying to my sponsor, and and uh, I I started getting into a lot of trouble, and and uh, and uh, the, the addictions, other addictions started. I remember by the time I was three years sober, I was addicted to peanut butter. <laughs> you know, I you can I can just change my my addictions and and, and emotions to different things, you know, that'll fix it. I can remember leaving meetings, you know, and I'd put back on the leather jacket and the dark glasses and shop in the supermarkets in front of the peanut butter shelf. <laughs> and playing the same game I played with the alcohol. And I and I get that big super size of Skippy. <laughs> I go rush home, you know, and, and draw the drapes. Get the spoon out. 
You get in front of the tube and eat peanut butter, eat the whole jar. And I said, you know, I started gaining weight. I said, you know, you know, my, my problem is I need to get this, that smaller size. <laughs> The insanity didn't say stop eating peanut butter. <laughs> I'd be showing up, turning up the collar in front of the shelf, you know, and, you know, I'd be breathing hard, you know. <laughs> hands, hands all clammy. And uh, I don't want the other shoppers to see this middle-aged woman in front of the peanut butter shelf, you know, uh, freaking out. <laughs> you know, and by that time, I was down to the little size, and I'd just be trying to decide whether I should get the crunchy or the smooth. <laughs> And the insanity was absolutely there. So I, um, so I got well and, and I had this, all these things back again. And one day this phone rang and from central office and I couldn't keep lying. And, um, God was getting my attention again. And this lady from central office says, uh, Clara, she says, we got a 12 step call. It's, uh, I said, where? I wasn't thrilled. And I said, where? <laughs> And she said, it's on Skid Row. I said, oh, my goodness, really? I said, well, you know, I've never really, you know, dealt with a wet wet drunk. Uh, 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 she said, well, just just take the call. Just go. And so I hung up. I got all the information. I hung up, and then I I uh, called my sponsor. I wanted to clear this with her. So I pick up the phone, and I called Carol, and I said, Carol, I said, I just had a call from central office. And they want me to go down to Skid Row on a 12-step call. And I said, I don't think I'm qualified. I don't think I'm qualified for this. It seems that a lot of other people in Alcoholics Anonymous have more experience. And I was just running it by her. She wasn't saying a word. <laughs> and I kept talking. And uh, finally, I just said to her, look, I don't want to do it. And she said, I don't care what you don't want to do. You do it anyway. And she hung up. So I had heard you don't go on a trust up call alone, so I um, called her, this little baby I was sponsoring. She's about 90 days sober. <laughs> a little Hollywood actress. And I said to her, we're going on a 12-step call. She said, where? <laughs> I said, it's down on Skid Row. She said, I don't want to do that. I said, I don't care what you don't want to do. <laughs> and we get in my car, and we go down the skid row, and we go into this uh, hotel. It was not part of the Hilton chain, I assure you. <laughs> and we walk in there, and and they were playing. They had those big transistor radios, and they and they were dancing and doing that get-down music, and and I asked the clerk, there's a little red arrow along the wall to a bell, and and, uh, and, I, I, and I rang the bell, and the clerk opened up that little slot, and he said, yes. I said, do you have a young lady in here named Dorothy? And he said, oh, yeah, she's up on the third floor, and we get on this elevator with beer cans and wine bottles and urine on the elevator floor, and we pulled up our pants so our cuffs wouldn't get in it, and we get up to the third floor, and, and we walk over three our alcoholics that were passed out in, in the hall there, and... And, and, and the clerk had said, we don't have any numbers in this hotel, but she's at the end of the hall. And I knock on the door, and, and I heard a little voice say, come in, and I, I stepped into another world. Got to see the roots of the disease and the yets. Young woman, about 23 years old, was on that floor in a fetal position. And wine balls all around, her, and, it, and, and the stench was unbearable. And water bugs were so thick, they crunched as we walked. And I looked down, and I said, oh, but by the grace of God. I'd had my skid row, but nobody saw me down there. And it was another moment of truth, and I guess God was saying, get busy. Get busy. And for the first time in my whole life, I had a feeling and an experience of inner love for another human being. And as I say every morning on my knees, God, tell me, how can I be of service today? How can I make the difference in somebody's life? And we got her up and we cleaned her up and, and she lost all her body functions. And, and I called the central office and I said, what do we do with it? And they told us where, we, where to take her. We took her into a little all-night all, all diner on Skid Row. 
And as a result of that 12-step call, I have been active on Skid Row every Saturday morning for 12 years. And you see, I see that. I see. And I see the yets. And I see the roots of the disease. And we took in this dine and we started feeding the coffee. She was quite drunk. And for the first time, I started to talk about what I had learned here. The 12 steps. And I said, the first step, you know, that we're powerless over alcohol. And the second part of that first step says, and our lives are unmanageable. She could identify with that. Talked about the second step, and I said, God, would it restore us to sanity? She didn't want to hear that. And <laughs> I got to the third step, I said, the willingness to turn our will and our lives over the care of God. And she stood up drunk, and she was wriggling back and forth, and she said, don't you talk to me about God. And I had a lot of unresolved anger, and I reached across and put... <laughs> I reached across and grabbed that little pink sweater we put on her, and I pulled her forward. I was going to punch her out. <laughs> but the book said, having had a spiritual awakening, <laughs> as a result of the steps, we try to carry the message. Didn't say beat them up if they don't want it. <laughs> and I don't know where Dorothy is this morning, but I want to tell you, she brought into my life through that experience. Another perception of the program and a loving God through service. And for that, I, you know, I um, was on another crossroad and another journey. And that journey is to bring me to places like this and rooms like this. And for that, you know, I owe it all to that God. To the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, because you rendered me sane and you rendered me sober through God's grace. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.